I had uh, no idea that today would be a road down memory lane for me. Um, I'm from, from Thomasville, and uh, so I grew up going to Tallahassee, that was the big city uh, when, when I was growing up, and so I have vivid memories of all the fires burning along the plantation lands um, between Thomasville and Tallahassee in the springtime. Uh, just, it's an incredible sight if you ever get a chance. It's, it's just beautiful to see uh, out there. And then um, had no clue about the award for Betty Jenright. Uh, her husband, um, as you said, was an architect, and he gave me my first drafting job in Thomasville. So um, kind of got me emotional <laughs> as well um, out there. Uh, when Amy um, asked me to um, come, uh, first thing I had to do, of course, is check with my wife, uh, since I would uh, uh, be out for, for two evenings, basically, and we have two children, and I do afternoon duty uh, with the children. So, of course, that means scrambling of schedules. And then, uh, once again, I had no clue that, um, you know, of course, that's a little irritation sometimes between spouses, but uh, then I had no clue I'm going to be totally in trouble, because now I've spent $50 worth of native plants. And, <laughs> And like Karen from earlier, I am on plant restriction. Um, not because I have a lot of pots, I've planted everything, but I've spent too much money. So um, I'm gonna have to figure out a way to get those in the garage tonight and um, put them somewhere where they can't be seen till this weekend when I can sneak out into the yard. Um, I, I do appreciate the invitation uh, to come speak to you um, today. Uh, uh, I hope I got several things I, I did want to, um, to, to share with you. I um, want to go a little bit briefly about the history of the wildflower program with Georgia DOT, um, our wildflower tags that we have and, and what they do for our wildflower program, um, how we plant um, daffodils that have been incorporated into our program, a little bit about some conservation efforts that we, that we partake in, um, a little bit about the landscape reviews um, that we do statewide. And then uh, lastly, uh, a little bit about native riparian seed mixes that we're actually working with the University of Georgia on doing some research on for our roadsides. <coughs> now, in our wildflower program, we cover all ge geographic regions in the state. Um, from the mountains where you see some black-eyed Susans, to the coastline where we have some, some poppies, landscape coreopsis. We, this is some cosmos that was uh, planted in Crisp County. And some poppies in Atlanta. Now, as far as our history, GI and the Garden Club of Georgia um, have been working together for over 30 years. Um, for our wildflowers and our wildflower programs on their state routes. Now in 1973, uh, the Garden Club of Georgia representatives, including the First Lady um, of Georgia, Rosalind Carter, uh, met with Lady Bird Johnson in Texas to find out what they were doing and how we could incorporate that into uh, Georgia. In 74, GDOT began uh, our wildflower program with the collaboration of the Garden Club of Georgia. Um, GDOT foreman at the time began planting uh, wildflowers in addition to their regular maintenance duties. Now, until, not, uh, until 2008, the Garden Club judges and maintenance personnel toured the state every year. We have seven districts that they had to go through. Um, and they would look at all the foreman's wildflower areas and their wildflower books and their wildflower posters. Um, <coughs> You know, later in the summer, of course, they reconvene um, and look at all the presentation boards, and um, they would choose a winner um, for the best wildflowers in, in a particular district um, and for one for the state. Now, representatives from the Garden Club presented monetary awards to each one of our winners, um, and, and of course, a, a lot of that funding came from the Cason uh, uh, and Nancy Calloway. Um, and Virginia Hand Callaway Awards and, and you know, funding from their programs. Now, maintenance foreman like Stephen King, who's now retired, uh, took great pride in, in his wildflower areas, as many of the others did. 
Um, as you remember, though, in 2008, um, the economy tumbled. Um, like many agencies and companies, uh, GDOT uh, suffered, uh, you know, under under the, the economy. Our financial resources and the number of personnel that we had um, dropped dramatically. In fact, I think in 2008 we had 5,700 employees, and we're now down to around 4,100. So um, that really limits the. the um, maintenance activities uh, in our core function of what we can and cannot do. Now fortunately for GDOT, um, in 1998, the legislature and the governor supported a law creating the wildflower tag. Um, the State Board of Transportation, the Garden Club of Georgia, uh, and other private citizens partnered with GDOT to secure the minimum 500 uh, pre-sales that we had to have to get the tag started. Um, in 1999, the wildflower tag featuring the, the Black Eyed Susan uh, was introduced and the Roadside Enhancement and Beautification Fund was established. Now we began utilizing the tag money collected from, you know, from the, uh, the funds from the tag in the fall of 2002, uh, helping us to plant wildflowers. Now, the department uh, debuted an additional wildflower tag choice in August of 2008, which is the purple cone flower. Now, GDOT now receives $10 uh, for every tag that's sold and renewed. Um, also in 2008, uh, due to the um, cutbacks that we had in personnel, we began using contractors to plant our wildflowers. Now, we used to be restricted to a three inch square on the left side of the tag. Uh, this requirement has been loosened in the last couple of years, and we have now had the opportunity to incorporate color in, in, in the whole tag. Uh, GDOT is now working on some draft um, proposals uh, to uh, work with the Department of Revenue on. Uh, these are, are two options that we've been considering, Lansley Coreopsis and the Poppies. And then these are are two others that we are also uh, being considered. Uh, one of the things that's been very difficult for us is, um, of course, the uh, state patrol and, and a lot of people want to be able to see those numbers. So that means you have to do a lot of artwork as far as fading in and out in certain areas. areas. So that's one of our, our uh, challenges right now is trying to figure out how to have that pop of color and still be able to see the, uh, the numbers on the tags. Now, how do we plant our flowers? <clears throat> we have to follow strict erosion control standards when we're working on state routes. If you disturb more than an acre or really anything in this day and age, you have to be considered, um, you have to sometimes use silt control, you know, silt fences and everything else. You see that on the construction projects. That would drive the cost of planting wildflowers out of the roof for us and, and just wouldn't be feasible. So one of the things that we do is we use drill seeders. Um, that's in the uh, uh, right here. And it lightly scratches the ground and drops the seed in at the same time and then comes back over with a wheel and kind of uh, presses it into the soil. And generally, you're only wanting to go no deeper than an eighth or quarter inch. You plant that seed any deeper and it's not going to come up. So by doing this, it allows us to um, avoid the whole erosion control issue because we're doing as little ground disturbance as possible. The one challenge on that is it does limit where you can put the wildflower seeds. Uh, I get calls every year, you know, can you put them on this slope and can you do that here? Well, it has to be typically where a tractor can, can function uh, out there. So that does make it a little more challenging, um, but it is one of the ways that we've been able to plant the acreage that we are able to plant um, and, and keep the cost as low as possible. Well, some of our typical uh, seed mixes uh, for North Georgia, I'm showing you those, and the common name and the scientific name, and then some for um, South Georgia. The Coreopsis species, as you'll, you'll see, is scattered throughout, and one of the reasons is the, the roadway is just such a harsh condition you consider how hot it gets here in Georgia, then you add the wind from the semi-trucks and the cars, and then you add the heat from the asphalt, um, and typically poor soils along the edge of the road, and it makes it very difficult for anything to grow. 
Um, so um, the Coreopsis species, fortunately, likes the heat. It's, it's pretty, um, most of those species are pretty tough. Um, but that is one of our challenges overall with wildflowers, is, is finding a species that uh, can handle those harsh conditions. Now, one exciting part of the working with wildflower program is the opportunity um, to photograph huge fields of blooms like the Plains Coreopsis in this picture. Um, we have to design for high speeds in order for you to actually be able to see it. I don't encourage you to stop and on the side of the road and get out uh, on the track, you know, on the side of the road. It's just too dangerous. Um, that makes it challenging because uh, we have to do normally an acre or more, and we have to do a lot of times mass, this mass planting of one species just so that when you drive by those three seconds going 75 miles an hour, you can go, wow, there, I mean, that was something beautiful. Um, we, you know, we love the whole idea of the meadow, um, but unfortunately, if most of the time to appreciate a meadow, you have to actually be in the meadow, and we're not in, in that situation, unfortunately, where we want you to get out and, and pick the flowers. This is some uh, Plains Coreopsis um, uh, up in North Georgia. Here's some additional, it's, it's been a very reliable uh, flower for us. Um, Drumming Flocks is a reseeding annual that performs especially well in the sandy soils on the coastal plain. So you'll, you'll see this, um, we try to promote this over in our coastal areas. Uh, Golden Wave Coreopsis is, an, is another one that we use. Um, it excels in sandy soils and provides a, a you know, bri brilliant color. Um, this is also a very good one that um, if you collect the seeds, you can, or just cut the plants whenever they're seeding, and you can go down and just drop it and shake it out, <laughs> that it'll actually you know, carry on down the road. So it, it's a very easy reseeder uh, for us. So you, and it especially does well over near the coastal area. Here's some more Plains Coreopsis. Uh, this is some Lance Leaf Coreopsis. It's a truly beautiful um, Coreopsis. The trick with this, it is it won't bloom the first year. So you plant it and you've got to wait a little while. So then that's, that's hard for, for us and I know it's for the public too. Um, you know, normally you want to see color after you've, you've, you've gone to the work to seed something. But if, if you wait for it, it, it can be spectacular. Now, there, there are not a lot of, um, well, most of our seeding goes on, well, we have a mix. We, we do a spring mix in the fall. We plant the seeds in the fall. They're able to germinate during the uh, winter months and, and come up normally in April and May. Um, that's normally a mix of annuals and perennials. Um, then we also add um, the cosmos, which we can't plant in the wintertime. It has to be planted during the heat of the summer. It's normally planted in uh, June or July, and that gives us some fall color in, um, throughout August and September, and sometimes into October. It's a very reliable flower. It is an annual. Occasionally it will reseed, uh, but we treat it as an annual. Um, and uh, it, when, when this is in bloom, the, the governor gets calls, the commissioners, your elected officials get calls, and we see articles in the paper. Um, it's, you know, the wildflowers are one of the few times that DOT actually gets good press. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, this is some sulfur cosmos um, over in Putnam County. And also, you, you know, it's a, not as cold tolerant as the pink, so we generally will use a lot of the pink as you go further north. There's another picture of the, the landscape coreopsis that you have to wait for. Uh, this is some corn poppy and, and lace leaf coreopsis. And some uh, lace leaf coreopsis and some daisies in here. Uh, some uh, flowers in Glasscock County. Some corn poppy. Corn poppy is another you know, early spring performer that does very well for us. And uh, like I said, we always get calls when the, when the poppies are in the room. 
Here's uh, some of the Black Eyed Susans. Now, about eight years ago, we started incorporating uh, daffodils into our, um, our wildflower program. Uh, we've planted over a million so far uh, throughout the state. Once again, we're planting five to 15,000 bulbs at a time in one location. And uh, during that eight years, a lot of these plots we've added to over the years so we can make them even longer and, and, and more spectacular, hopefully. Um, we have a contractor who puts the bulbs out for us in the fall. Um, the bulbs, of course, were, um, <clears throat> we purchase the bulbs and give them to the contractor um, and, uh, out there. We worked with the um, Georgia Daffodil Society in trying to uh, pick some species that would hopefully, um, some old-fashioned varieties, things that would uh, double and spread for us. Um, these are just some of the ones we've used before. The tricky thing about daffodils is that when you want, you know, two or three hundred thousand, they're hard to find. Mm -hmm. um, so we're pretty much at the will of some of the vendors. Um, I believe um, up near Williamsburg is where we get most of our bulbs. Um, vendor, I can't think of their name right now. But um, it really kind of depends what's out there for that year. Um, so we're kind of dependent on what's, what's available. Um, but we do try to pick species. There are species that do better down here in our heat, in our climate, in our clay. Uh, so we do try to pick those species. These are just some, some photos of some of the different areas where we've, where we've planted. Some in Cobb County. is down in, in Troop County, uh, where I-185 I and 85 split. And this is one of the areas, it's a large area, uh, so we've been adding to, to that over the years. This is the Welcome Center in Augusta. I-575 in Cherokee County. Uh, Welcome Center down near Savannah. near the area near the Macon area office on I-75. On to some of our, our conservation. Um, the <clears throat> one of the things that we have to be concerned about, and when Amy called me and asked me to come speak to you, um, I said, you know, you this group may not always want to hear what, what GDOT has to do, unfortunately. Um, we are supportive of our native um, uh, forbs and wildflowers and you know, herbs and things and grasses. Um, but we also had to be very concerned because when a plant is considered rare or endangered, it can stop a construction project or it can stop a maintenance project or it can cost many thousands of dollars more in uh, delays or even moving or shifting a roadway project. So you can understand from the engineers, I'm a landscape architect, but I have to work with them. A lot of engineers, um, they don't want anything to interfere with their projects. Um, you know, we recently had a, a maintenance project where we were basically having to add that little four foot of uh, pavement on the side of a road and clip the shoulders, and by clipping I mean if you don't come and cut the um, soil back a little bit off the side of the, most of these roads you drive on, after three or four years, the silt builds up, and then when it rains, the water stays on the road instead of drifting off into the grass or the, or the swale. So we have to periodically come and do a little bit of maintenance work along those shoulders. And we had the true native um, uh, cone flower, um, which had not even been spotted in an area, but however, which might have be known to be in the area, and it delayed the entire project till they waited till the summer to see if the flower showed up. So that's where we have to balance between our natives and, and, and what we have to do as a core function for your safety. So uh, that, that's a, it's a tricky thing. 
um, out there. You know, we also have, you know, during the 2008 to 2010, we cut back our mowing um, uh, to, to save funds. And during those two years, the governor probably received hundreds of letters about, you know, why isn't GDOT mowing the grass? Why aren't they taking care of the roadsides? And all those letters come to me to respond to. Um, so, and during that whole two years, I only received one letter that went to the governor that said, I love the blue stem and the um, beautiful native switchgrass that was out there. Uh, thank you so much for having that program. So there's a, a perception issue uh, with the public, um, which may change someday, and I hope it does. But right now, the public wants it to look like a golf course on the side of the road. They want their, their grass mowed. Um, out west, Midwest, Missouri, Texas, they, are, they have a different public perception of their native grasses and a lot of their native forests than we do in this environment right now. I don't know if any of y'all are familiar with Freedom Parkway up in Atlanta. It goes to the Jimmy Carter um, Library. And when it was originally designed, it was an entire meadow look. It had 20 you know, to 40 foot wide medians, and the whole concept was the meadow. It was planted that way, and within two years, you don't have to start mowing it because there were so many complaints. It, you know, the public just wasn't ready for that type of, um, that look on the side of the road. And, and maybe someday we will, we hope so. Uh, but some of the things that we do in conservation, um, I know down in like Charlton County near the Okefenokee, where we have, um, you know, the road is just above the water line. Um, we do have some wet areas and they try to um, alter their mowing schedules so that they can allow the pitcher plants to, to exist out there. These are some other examples of just some of the um, areas where they, they try to be a little more careful in programming and planning their, their mowing schedules. Up in North Georgia, uh, we have a state route that goes into a state park, and I cannot think of a state park at the moment. Um, but they discovered some of the uh, French gentian uh, up in that area. And um, at first it was kind of up where, oh, GDOT, stop doing what you're doing. And then everybody realized that because of our mowing schedule is what actually allows the gentian to survive. If we stop mowing, the sweet gums and pines and everything would grow up and, and it wouldn't get the sunlight it needs. So now we're very careful with any herbicide program we have up in that area, and we try to coordinate our mowing so that uh, we keep the uh, fringe tension uh, where it is out there. So you know, those are some of the ways that we can work um, with the with the public and with you know when we find a, a special plant to to try to preserve it. Now, some of the other things that we do, I just want to touch on, uh, in case y'all ever have any questions, um, you can certainly you know, call my office. Um, there are no landscape architect designers at GDOT in the design fields, and I work in the maintenance office. So, and I have two other landscape architects with me for the whole state. Um, we try to review all the, all the landscape projects that come on that affect the, the interstate, whether it's a big road construction project that involves <coughs> landscaping, or it could be the bank who needs a driveway and wants to put street trees or put plants on the state route or irrigation, you know, anything like that um, typically comes through our office. Our main goal is not trying to determine what you can and can't plant on the roadway. Our main goal is safety. Because um, we have to think of standards like if you're driving on a 55 mile an hour road, there are federal and state standards about how far back a fixed object has to be. So if you have to leave the road because of a tire blows out, you don't hit a tree or you don't hit you know, some other fixed object. But um, we do see some very interesting designs throughout the state. Um, and now the economy's picking up, the um, projects with landscaping are starting to show back up into the projects. And, I like to see all that beautification and the community pride uh, that, that's out there. Uh, this happened to be a um, very interesting bridge project, the Fifth Street Bridge that goes over to Georgia Tech, and they wanted to turn it into a park. You know, we had to think of, you know, I-75 goes right under there, so you have to think about where does all that water go whenever you water those plants um, out there. So there were just a lot of things that had to be considered for, for that type of design. Um, we generally um, 
Typically on the right of way, the best choice of enhancement we try to promote are our trees, our native trees. Um, they, everything else, it's just such a harsh environment uh, out there and maintaining anything is difficult. Um, but we do have some, some uh, native trees that do well, in, you know, of course, down here in Georgia and can handle these rough conditions. Um, a lot of this, uh, like burning bush, was planted for the Olympics. Um, you know, it's very hard to get a policeman to go in there to get somebody out of there if we have a problem. <laughs> so the state patrol and the police really do appreciate uh, areas where they can see what's going on before they have to um, uh, deal with an issue also. Um, most of our landscapes on the right way are funded, installed, and maintained by local governments. As I said earlier, we don't have landscape crews, we don't have people with horticultural knowledge out on the right of way doing work. The, the same person who mows the grass is the, typically the same person who's filling the potholes and, and repairing the guardrail uh, out there. Uh, they don't know the different species of trees, you know, unfortunately, uh, and, and plants. So if, if a community does want to do some type of enhancement, we rely on that community to take on the maintenance uh, of, of what it is they want to install. Uh, another program that we have going on, and I just wanted to, some of you I've already talked to are aware of it. We, we do have get, the Gateway Grant Program. Um, it's, it's funded through um, tree removal in front of billboards, which is, we won't get into that, but it is a source of funding. And by law, that mo the money that's generated from that program has to go into beautification. So we have created a Gateway Grant Program that offers 50, up to $50,000 grants uh, for just for plant material and uh, we had an open call recently we we're in the process of reviewing over 80 applications uh, throughout the state uh, this example right here is one from our previous uh, calling that we had a, a year or two ago this is in Vidalia, Vidalia Georgia and just to see what what they proposed you can see this is just a beautiful streetscaping scene and uh, uh, there's another shot of it and this is what they were able to do with the Gateway Grant Funds. So um, we have people doing a variety of things with them, but uh, it's always wonderful to see um, when you can just take something that's so ugly and transform it into something that, you know, entrance into their downtown area and make it look so much nicer. So it really does instill pride in the community, and, and that's a program we're very you know, proud of. It's not a huge amount of money, but a lot of times it can be seed money, and the community can add to it and, and do an even bigger project. Now, uh, lastly, I just wanted to share with you a little bit about our, our native riparian grass mix. Um, when I came to the uh, GDOT about 16 years ago, um, one of the concerns that we saw is that we have what we have are different specifications. And one of them is our typical grassing specification. It's very generic. It applies just to anything along the roadside. Um, but anytime you came upon a stream, a river, a wetland, anything like that, all of a sudden, the, all these designers were scrambling for, you know, what kind of what we call special provisions, creating a new specification for what are you going to do near that body of water or that sensitive area. Um, and they were all over the place. So um, about five or six years ago, we were able to work with our construction office and put a riparian seed mix in our seeding spec for our regular grassing. So let's say this I-75 project that goes on forever. Um, let's say you, you, know, you do cross a couple of bodies of water. The contractor can use the regular grassing spec for you know, the regular seeding up to wherever that sensitive area is. And that same specification will now have some riparian seed, seed mixes, you know, some native grasses and forbs in there. So when they hit that area, and they have to be sensitive around that, that body of water. They can use that same specification and incorporate the, the blue stems and, and some of the native wildflowers in there. You know, get rid of the fertilizer, get rid of any kind of chemicals, and just stick to what needs to be down near that water, which is basically you know, no, nothing that would harm the water or, or affect the, the fish or, or plants. Um, we generally... Um, encourage a multi-trophic type planting where we're doing seeding, we're putting uh, 
some small native uh, trees and, and shrubs around a, a sensitive area. This isn't, I'm not, unfortunately this isn't glamorous um, <laughs> type work, uh, but it, it is a very important type of work. Um, you know, when we are approaching upon stream buffers or affecting the, you know, the water that goes into what you're drinking, we want to make sure we're, we're being as sensitive as possible. Uh, there's just an example of some of the bare root seedlings that would be used uh, to help stabilize the slope. Our native grass table, which I know you probably cannot see it, but the grasses would have things like switch grasses, the bluestone, purple top, and we have a mix of cool and warm season grasses because our projects go on year round. So they may be seeding in December, they may be seeding in July. So they have to have something to help stabilize that soil at all times. And along with picking out several of these species, they're also picking out some native, native herbaceous perennials, you know, things like joe pie weed, swamp milkweed, frost aster uh, out there. So, um, and, they're in, and these are the kind of situations where we come upon, you know, and it's just, it's just a nightmare. And um, uh, this was an especially difficult project here because they kept, I think the contractor stabilized it three or four times and then we kept having those torrential rains and it would literally flood that whole area over there and just wash everything, you know, down the creek. So a lot of this can be very challenging, especially during like last year when we had so much rain. Uh, Here's a uh, riparian seed mix growth. This is six months later. Like I said, it's not glamorous, but this is a, an area where if you start going there and walk around, you can start seeing the native species. I apologize for the blurriness of this picture, but um, we're working with uh, uh, Dr. McCullough uh, up at the Griffin Station for UGA. And he's doing a lot of research for us where they're actually going on some of these sloped areas, which is typically what we have to deal with along the roadside, and um, actually removing the material there. And then they're experimenting with the species that we have um, to see what maybe are some of the best mixes, what may do better in certain times of the year. So we're doing constant research on a lot of the native species and that hopefully we can encourage on the back slopes the roads because I know like I said the public wants to see the edge of the road mode and for safety reasons a lot of times we have to do it anyway um, but we do have a lot of large areas and back slopes areas where you know the public's never going to be that we can encourage a lot of these native species to grow that's all I had for today um, like I said it wasn't just all wildflowers but I did want to share some of our other programs and research that we're doing and um, certainly if you've got any questions I'll be glad to answer them. Yes, all of the wildflower tag money goes straight back into planting wildflowers or buying daffodils. No, all of it. All of it does. It. The the legislature um, back in '99 created the roadside enhancement and beautification fund. Now that fund, uh, it, the wildflower tag money and any donations, which um, um, every so many years the Garden Club still offers wonderful donations for wildflowers uh, to us, and that money goes directly into that fund. The Garden Club of Georgia does, and um, that fund also is where the money from tree removal uh, that we collect goes into that fund also. And while it's all one checking account. Uh, we keep the, the two pots of money separate in the way we spend it. Like I said, the money from the tree removal goes to these gateway grants uh, that I showed you an example of. Uh, the tag money goes right back into uh, wildflowers. Occasionally we do, we do, we, we um, buy seed packets, uh, which we had some out here today. So we use it for some promotional activities too. But the main bulk of it goes back into it. No salaries are paid out for, you know, out of it or anything like that. Yes, ma'am. Um, are the list of the plants that you use available? Is, is that available to the public to see which ones you're using? Oh, oh of course, we have to buy in bulk. Um, so, no, but I mean the list. 
not not with the plan. Do we purchase from? Yeah. So that we would know oh, what what you recommend for a different area. Oh well, uh, our website we do have. If you go to the GDOT website and type in wildflowers, we'll take you to our wildflower page. I believe we do have a list of um, names there. I'll leave some of my cards out on the front tables. You're certainly always welcome to call us. If you have any questions, and we can get your sources. We can purchase from anything like that. We're always willing to share. Yeah. Hi, Doug. Hi, I don't know if that list is online, um, but I, it's something I can send to you. To, I can send that to Amy so that she can have that available to to the mm -hmm. to see it. Daffodils, our contractor has a drill. Well, we when we put out the contracts, we can't have multiple vendors. Uh, there have been, been very few people who've ever been on wildflowers or bulk. Mm -hmm. It's just not. It's not. There's not a huge market for it. Um, and so I believe. I believe. We, I know we only have one person, one company planting plants at the moment. Um, I can't remember if we have one or two companies planting wildflowers. Um, 